Hello everyone, welcome to Science Friday, which is hosted by General Club. Hi. Hello, Hello. Dee. General Club is an organization that by a team of students of, and faculty members who train new people to present, dissect scientific journals, and most importantly, provide a forum for database discussion. We take on almost any relevant issue that you are passionate about. If you want to be trained as a presenter, or if you're a veteran presenter looking for a venue, please email Anya and we will work with you to make that happen. I want to take a moment to acknowledge someone on the General Club exec team. This week it is Abby. Please give up it up for her consistent and thoughtful contributions to General Club. The team is mentored by Dr. Paul Hauser and Luke D. There are three leaders. Akshar handles the training of people on our team. Anya handles the training of presenters. And I curate our talks and handle Science Thursday itself. This is how our meeting today is going to run. Today, Journal Club member Sasha C is going to present for about 20 minutes. There'll be time for questions mid-presentation. Please type your questions into the chat as you have them. The simpler the question, the better. We will organize them, either call on you or ask the question for you if you prefer. We are recording this presentation to be shared via YouTube, so if you would not like to appear in the recording, please only private message your questions to Akshar. Um, during the presentation, we ask that you keep your cameras on and stay muted unless you're asked to clarify a question. Um, yes, after the presentation, you can use the chat or ask questions. Um, we will have moderators during the discussion. Um, thank you all for joining us. I want to give you a heads up. We have interesting presentations coming up, including some about life on Mars and our guest presenter, Robert Sapolsky. Um, but today, please give it up for Sasha C. Woo! Sasha! Go to the... All right. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be presenting on how Google demonstrated quantum supremacy um, with its Sycamore processor. So I want to start with a question. And that is, um, what do weather forecasting, cybersecurity, traffic optimization, AI, finance and improved batteries all have in common. And I'll give you a few seconds to think about this. Okay, so the answer is that these are all areas that can be improved. Um, and more specifically, quantum computing is a tool that can improve them. Um, so quantum computing is a very relevant and applicable field of research. But what actually is quantum computing? Um, well, to understand quantum computing, we first need to understand classical computing. Um, classical computers, like the MacBook Pros we use, are very intricate systems. Um, they're powered by a computer chip, um, which contains millions to billions of transistors. Uh, for example, the newest Apple M1 chip has 16 billion transistors. Um, you can think of these transistors as tiny switches that control the flow of electricity, which is what most fundamentally is used to, to perform computation. Um, and transistors can store one bit of information. They can be in a state of either zero or off or one or on. Okay, so now that we understand classical computing, what is quantum computing? So quantum computing leverages the properties of quantum mechanics to perform computation. And quantum mechanics describes the properties of the universe at a very small scale. Um, and it's very different from classical physics. Um, quantum computing, so quantum computing can be thought of as an application of um, quantum mechanics. So if we continue the analogy from the previous slide, um, where a classical computing bit um, can be thought of as a switch that can be in a state of zero or one, um, then a quantum computing bit or qubit can be thought of as a dial. Um, and that's shown here. Um, and this is due to a unique property of quantum mechanics called superposition where a qubit can be in a state of zero or one at the same time. 
Um, however, when a qubit's value is measured, it must collapse to a zero or one state. So once we look at the qubit or measure it, it must either be a zero or one. Um, another property of quantum mechanics is entanglement, which says that if two qubits are entangled, um, if you know certain information about one qubit, you automatically know certain information about the other. So that was a bit wordy. So as a classical analogy, um, if two friends are entangled and you learn that friend one prefers vanilla ice cream over chocolate, you may immediately know that friend two also prefers vanilla. Um, and this is regardless of how far apart the friends are. Okay, so let's compare classical computing to quantum computing. Um, what are the potential and flaws of quantum computing? So classical computing utilizes the classical laws of physics, while quantum computing unlocks the laws of quantum mechanics. Um, so superposition is powerful because qubits can be in multiple states at once, meaning they can store more information than classical bits, which can only be in one state. Um, Entanglement is a useful tool for computation because it allows for computation across multiple qubits simultaneously. And this is not possible in classical computing. So let's talk about this notion of quantum supremacy. Um, quantum supremacy is demonstrated when a quantum computer can solve a problem faster or more efficiently than a classical computer. Um, so a question you may be asking is, if quantum computing has all these tools that classical computing doesn't, why are we even using classical computers? Um, and the answer is that quantum computing is a, re a relatively recent field of study, and it has flaws. Um, the main flaw of quantum computing is noise. Um, and this is synonymous with error in computation. Um, an example of noise are electromagnetic fields that interfere with the energies of the qubits. And we want our quantum systems to be isolated from noise or error, but we also want to be able to manipulate qubits and measure them. So this creates a trade-off. Um, the more isolated the system is, the harder it is to interact with but the easier it is to manipulate the system, the more noisy it will be. So if this idea of, of noise is confusing, um, I want to present a classical analogy. So say you're trying to carry a can of soda over a long distance without it spilling. Um, it's pretty easy when the can hasn't been opened, right? But say you add 10 more cans to your initial can. Um, it's harder, but still pretty easy, as long as they haven't been opened. Um, now let's say you open all of the cans. Suddenly the task becomes really difficult to manage. I mean, you could be careful and walk slowly, but the soda will begin to evaporate. So this is similar to a qubit, because if we manipulate or measure our qubits, um, like opening the cans, it becomes difficult to manage without spilling the soda. And the difficulty of the task um, grows exponentially as you increase the number of qubits or cans. So mitigating noise in quantum computing is vital and it's a whole field itself. So let's get into how Google um, went about demonstrating quantum supremacy. Um, so, Google is a leader in quantum computing, and they demonstrated quantum supremacy um, with their Sycamore processor. And remember, quantum supremacy is demonstrated when a quantum computer can solve a problem faster or more efficiently than a classical computer. So how did they do it? Um, their process began with a small amount of qubits, and they randomly manipulated them in a circuit. Um, this process included entangling some qubits. Um, so this is a representation of the circuit they used. And each of these horizontal lines here represent a qubit. Um, these gray boxes represent gates or the manipulation that they're doing to the qubits. 
Um, and they're grayed out because this was a completely random manipulation process. Um, these bars that seem to be connecting the qubits um, are also gates, but they um, use entanglement across the qubits. Um, the next step was they measured the qubits and calculated the fidelity on a classical computer. And this gave a representation of the error involved in their process. Um, so these orange rectangles at the end of the circuit here, they represent measurement. And that's what they did after all this manipulation. Um, they then simulated the same task on a classical computer. Um, so they could compare the times between the classical and quantum computers. Um, and then they repeated this process with greater complexity um, by either increasing the number of qubits or increasing the complexity of the manipulation. Um, eventually, they reached a point where the quantum computer could accomplish the task in 200 seconds, while they predicted the best classical computer would take 10,000 years. And that is a big deal. Um, for reference, here is a photo of the Sycamore processor. Um, it's pretty small, only one centimeter, um, and it does look pretty cool. Um, so let's get into the data. Um, I'm sorry, I should interrupt, but there's a question in the chat from Peter. Do you want yeah. to ask Peter? Yo, uh, can you just explain what fidelity is? Yeah, so the fidelity um, is a measure of the error involved in their process. Um, it basically gives a representation of the noise and it compares the ideal probabilities um, of the circuit for each outcome with the experimental probabilities. And that's how they calculate the fidelity. Is that good? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, are there any more questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, let's get into the data. So this graph shows the data for the classically verifiable circuits or the circuits that are able to be verified by a classical computer in a reasonable amount of time. So on the x-axis are the number of qubits n, um, and on the y-axis is the cross-entropy benchmarking fidelity. Um, so like I just mentioned, this fidelity is a measure of the error in the circuit, and it compares the ideal or like expected probabilities of each outcome um, with what happened experimentally. So as you can see here, the fidelity decreases as the number of qubits increases. Um, and you can see that the numbers on this y-axis are actually powers of 10. So this represents 100% fidelity. This is 10%, this is 1%, and this is 0.1%. So although it may look linear, um, this is actually decreasing exponentially as the number of qubits grows. Um, this is due to um, noise between the qubits as the circuit becomes more complex. Um, you can also see that the data points are these weird colored shapes and their shapes seem to have significance. So as the circuit got more complex, Google wanted to create a simpler way to run the circuit while still maintaining accuracy. So they simplified the circuit by splitting the full circuit in two ways. Um, and testing if the accuracy of these simpler circuits match the full circuit. So these green X's um, represent the elided circuit. And this was where the full circuit was partially split, but still allowed for entanglement between the qubits. Um, and these blue pluses are the patch circuit, um, where the full circuit was completely isolated into two parts. Um, and the fidelity was calculated by the um, product of each of the parts individual fidelities. So as you can see, um, the data points for each type of these circuits are almost all on top of each other for each value of n here. Um, 
And this gave Google the confidence that these simplifications would be effective as the complexity of the circuit increased. Okay, so finally the part we've all been waiting for, um, actually demonstrating quantum supremacy. So here's a graph that looks similar, um, but it is different because this is the supremacy regime, which is where the quantum computer um, beats the classical computer. So on the x-axis is the number of cycles m. And this is a representation of the complexity of the manipulation of the circuit. Um, and on the y-axis again is the fidelity. So you'll notice that there are no red circles in this graph like there were in this one. Um, and this, this is because that it's unfeasible to verify the full circuit um, on a classical computer in a reasonable amount of time. So the gray numbers above each data point represent the time it would take a classical computer to achieve the same task with the same fidelity. Um, and the red numbers um, here represent um, how long it would take to classically verify the calculation. So as you can see, the last data point here shows that it would take a classical computer 10,000 years to complete the task, while it took the quantum computer um, only 200 seconds. So, and it would also take um, millions of years to classically verify the result. So this is a big deal um, because supercomputers are powerful machines and the quantum computer was able to achieve the task in far less time. Okay, are there any questions? Yeah, I think uh, there's one question from Amrita. Yeah, um, I might've missed this, but like how exactly or like what a quantum computer be able to calculate something infinite, like an uh, infinite series, for example, Taylor series expansion, or like, how would that work? Um, well, that's an application that this paper didn't really look into. Um, but yeah, there are many applications like that in math. Um, yeah, I can't explain it now in like a short amount of time. But yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I think there's also one from Barack. Okay. Here we go. Um, so uh, my question is, can you remind me what the task is that we were, that we were solving here? Yes, um, let me go back. So this is a um, randomly generated circuit. Um, it's basically like a random number generator. Um, so this circuit, when measured, it's produces a certain amount of outcomes, and each of these outcomes has um, an associated probability. So the task was to sit for the classical computer was to simulate this same circuit, um, but classically, which is obviously way more difficult for a classical computer um, because it doesn't have the tools of a quantum computer. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, I think there's one from Albert. Okay. Hi, um, yeah, I'm wondering like, this task seems like it would be particularly hard for a classical computer to simulate because it relies on all this entanglement business. So um, I know that there are some real world applications that are supposed to be much faster on quantum computers such as uh, factorization of large numbers. Uh, have we achieved quantum supremacy on any of those, I guess, more applicable tasks? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we're, yeah, so some of those problems have been um, worked on by quantum computers. Um, and you're right that this task um, does put a very large, large advantage on the quantum computer because simulating quantum um, circuits on classical computers um, is not very efficient at all. Um, so yeah, there are certain 
applications um, that benefit the quantum computer more, like the factorization you were talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Let me continue on to the, well, are there any more questions first? I think there's one from Aura okay. or maybe not anymore. Oh yeah. Are there any real world applications where quantum computers are slower than classical ones? Yeah, so there are many, many applications actually. So they're only, um, there, uh, there are vastly more things that classical computers can achieve um, better than quantum computers, just because we've had um, classical computers for such a long time and we've had time to develop them. Um, whereas quantum computing, it's a relatively recent field um, and there's a lot of flaws like noise um, which have to be dealt with. So yeah, there are definitely a lot of things that classical computers um, are better at, yeah. I see, so quantum computers are basically just better on a larger scale then? Um, yeah, maybe, just in certain problems um, because it's okay. yeah, a relatively recent field, yeah. But I think if we can deal with noise, then they can um, be exponentially better if we can deal with the error, yeah. Thank you, that's cool. Yeah, okay, any more questions? I think we're good. All right. Um, yeah, so it took the quantum computer 200 seconds. Well, they estimated that it would take the su supercomputer um, 10,000 years. Um, so let's get into the future of quantum computing. Um, and what does this experiment and its results mean for us? So I wanted to talk about Moore's law. And it states that the number of transistors on the microchip doubles every two years due to technological advances. Um, however, this law will only hold for so long and transistors will have to become small enough that they obey the laws of quantum physics instead of classical. So that begs the question, um, could quantum computing replace classical computing? And the answer is maybe. Um, so the task that Google gave the computers was specifically designed to give the quantum computer an advantage. And it was not an applicable problem to our lives. Um, nevertheless, the quantum computer beat the classical computer, which is promising for the future of quantum computing. Um, but noise is a large flaw in quantum computing, making it hard to implement successfully in our lives. Um, for example, quantum chips need to be cooled to a very low temperature, um, only a fraction above absolute zero, to prevent thermal energy interference. Um, and this would be extremely difficult to do compactly. So this photo on the right shows a cryostat, um, which was used for the quantum computer. And this is huge compared to the chip itself. Um, remember, the chip itself is only one centimeter big. Um, but this crest that is huge compared to it. Um, so this just represents um, how much noise is a flaw in quantum computing and how we need to work on it. Um, but this is a field that many quantum computer scientists are currently working on. And maybe if we can crack this, then quantum computers will take over. Um, yeah, so I want to thank you for listening. Um, and if you're interested in quantum computing or anything I talked about today, there are many resources available. Um, most notably, IBM Quantum Experience allows you to make your own quantum circuits and run them on real quantum computers, um, which is really cool. And you can also code quantum circuits using um, a Python library called Qiskit. And I've used this to run circuits on quantum computers. And it's really cool because you can see the probability distributions and 
the noise that's involved in that. Um, I also have book recommendations if you want to read about quantum computing. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Do we have any more questions? Because I know quantum computing is very confusing when you first learn about it. Oh yeah, Aura, do you have a question? I would love to hear about the book racks. Um. Yeah, sure. So there is a book called Quantum Computing Since Democritus, um, which is a pretty interesting book, I think. Um, and there's also a textbook con called Quantum Com Computation and Quantum Information. Um, and that it, it is a bit dense and it's quite mathy, but it's a um, it's a really good book if you want to go really deep into quantum computing. Okay, cool. I'll check those out. Thanks. Yeah. And by the way, this is like the quantum computer which they put in the cryostat here. So yeah, and that's the chip in there. Oh yeah, yeah, Marupa. Um, is it possible for like there to be a state or like something that disentangles two quantum bits? Like for example, I don't know, like a logic gate or something. Or I don't know if the paper covers that, but just wondering, like, is it possible for it to like get like dis or untangled? I'm not sure. Yeah. So there's a gate. Um. Well, I know there's. Um, uh, well, once you measure um, an entangled qubit, you, they're not entangled anymore because once you know the outcome of one, you automatically know the outcome of another. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but there are ways to undo like superposition. Um, for example, like there's a gate called the Hadamard gate and this puts um, a qubit into a superposition of zero and one. And if you apply this gate twice, it actually undoes this superposition, um, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. That's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have an all school meeting now. Um, so I think all Nueva students have to join. Sadly, we cannot keep it open for the adults to keep talking since Sasha herself is a student. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to um, email Sasha or reach out to one of the journal club heads. Um, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you guys next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming everyone. See you. Oh, okay. Willow and Oxford, do we have anything that we need to do? My metrics! <gasps> it's okay. You don't, didn't don't send the email! <gasps> no. He could not get mad for my metrics. I will not accept it. Okay, anyways. I mean, I don't think any of us would, but. We'll, we'll my metrics. Wait, why are you at school today? Why are you at school slash in the lab today, Anya? Me? Oh, I have XRT or had XRT. It's a, it's a yeah. is the host now. It just depends on whether Anya oh can. Gosh. Wait, what happened with Willow? Why is she gone? Well, you're the host now, Anya. I feel the power. I am the host now. I do feel the power. <laughs> you can shadow ban people or you can publicly ban someone. You can kick them out of this Zoom. Or now when I say no virus with no host, no yeah, virus, it's actually self-deprecation. <laughs> yeah, something that's just going to backfire. I hate to break it to you. And someday somebody's going to kick you out of the zoom. You're going to be like, oh shit, maybe I shouldn't have told them. <laughs> I'm quite solitary. 
Anya, is getting presenter a problem anymore or is it not a problem anymore? No, we have presenters until like the third or fourth week of next school year. Okay, cool. Then, then, okay. <laughs> Did you want to present? No, no, no. It was about that whole, whole outside presenter thing. But Oh, oh. Because at one point in my life, I remember hearing that getting presenters was a problem. Yeah, now it's now we're like totally fine. Now. <laughs> we have like so, many people. Okay, well then, well then yeah. the outside thing is really helpful then. Uh, if you uh, want to do it, we can do it. But it's like more of a getting audience than getting presenters now. If you want to do it. Oh yeah, the other school thing you meant. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to do it, but I feel like oh, I we're still recording. Hold on. Yeah. Bye, people. I'm happy to